right, so this is um, Rocket Recovery Systems Part 1 of 4. I'm going to spread these out over the year. Because <laughs> uh, the first time I gave this talk, it was nearly, nearly an hour long talk. Uh, so. All right, so this is why we're required to have recovery systems beyond the obvious. You want to get your stuff back because you invested money in it. And uh, you'd like to be able to fly a rocket more than once. Plus, you don't want it to fall on any anybody. But there is the NAR guidance in the uh, Model Rocket Safety Code, Paragraph 10, and the High Power Safety Code, Paragraph 12, specifying that you will use one. And then the same is mirrored in the uh, EEE Research Safety Code as well. So in this part one, it's just going to cover fundamentals of uh, rocket recovery systems. In this, we're going to cover various types of recovery systems, uh, how to apply Newton's second law of motion to parachutes, uh, and how to apply the ideal gas law to uh, sizing ejection chargers. And there you can see the, uh, the uh, unmanipulated equations uh, for um, second law. You know, net force is acting on a body is equal to mass times acceleration. And uh, pressure times volume is equal to uh, amount of gas times ideal uh, or universal gas constant times temperature. Okay, so there are lots of types of recovery systems. The first ones that you'll see on the uh, top left, that's uh, SpaceX's Grasshopper. So you're seeing that there are propulsive types of recovery systems where the vehicle makes a soft landing under power. There's a concept for uh, the Gemini capsule using a, uh, a sort of a hang glider. Now, that was never implemented, but it was tested. Uh, so there's a possible possibility that a, a spacecraft or a rocket could glide in under a, uh, under a parasail. And the space shuttle, while it's not immediately obvious that that is a type of recovery system, it's just part of the vehicle. It's winged uh, glider. The photograph in the, uh, the top right uh, looks old and black and white, but that's actually Curiosity. That's the uh, Mars Science Laboratory. That photograph was taken from a satellite in orbit at Mars while that was entering the atmosphere. That is a very large uh, supersonic parachute. So as uh, parachutes can be used in supersonic um, capacities as well as interplanetary landing missions. And Photograph in the bottom left, it's a space shuttle SRB uh, splashing down in the ocean under three large mains. So parachutes are used to recover reusable vehicles in that manner as well. A very unique concept shows the Orion capsule using a helicopter type system to, uh, to as a recovery system. And then probably the most simple of all is just throwing a streamer out of a small rocket, a uh, length of material that just creates a little bit of drag so that a, a very light rocket can make a, a light touchdown on the ground. But we're really going to focus on parachutes. That's what we use on most of our rocket applications. But even within parachutes, there are lots of types of parachutes. Uh, the one on the top left, that is a, a ribbon parachute. So it's essentially exactly that. It's ribbons uh, formed into a circumference. It has radial tapes uh, that go to uh, support lines and into the bridle. Uh, the parachute in the middle at the top, that is an uh, example of a ring sail parachute. So it's not just one continuous piece of canopy. It's a, it's a series of concentric rings and uh, that sort of act like the sails of a boat, but uh, turn into a, uh, into a full circle. A very uh, conventional type of parachute that you would see on a high power rocket. That's a parachute manufactured by uh, B2 Rocketry, actually. So they're, uh, they're CERT three class parachutes. It's also the, uh, the parasail, which uh, is uh, used for skydivers. In this case, it's being applied to a drone uh, so they can steer and fly. There have been many attempts for people to um, deploy a payload in a student launch initiative and use a, uh, a parasail to recover their payload. And the very funny looking one at the uh, bottom right, that's a balut. So it's a, uh, an inflatable type of parachute where air enters into some, uh, uh, some socks at the top and then inflates the, um, the balut, and then it just acts like a high drag device. 
Okay, so this is uh, Newton's second law here, as applied to a, a parachute design. So you have the, the net force is acting on a, uh, on a rocket is equal to the mass times the acceleration of that rocket. But um, that's kind of a complicated equation to try and apply to our situation. So we can make a couple of assumptions and make those equations a lot easier to deal with. And so the first one, we'll call that a steady state condition. We'll assume that the rocket is in a steady state, which means that there's it's no longer accelerating. The forces are balanced. Uh, so you have uh, F equals zero. Well, what two forces do you have that are balanced? What two forces are at work? Uh, you have the weight of the rocket, and then you have the drag, which is counteracting the weight. Uh, that way your rocket's no longer uh, accelerating. So you have D minus W equals zero, or D equals W. Uh, so that steady state condition, uh, the, the force of the drag of a parachute acting on the rocket can be assumed to be equal to the weight of the rocket. That simplifies our equation a lot. So uh, we need to characterize this, uh, this D, this drag. And so this is the, the drag equation here. We have uh, one half rho V squared, which is uh, dynamic pressure. So the uh, rho, that is the uh, density of the air, and the uh, V is the velocity at which the uh, rocket is descending. That S is the parachute's reference area, and it's important to note that uh, that reference area is different per manufacturer, and they will usually specify what they use as the reference area. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the reference area is either a projection of the shape of the parachute directly down, or it is actually the uh, area of the parachute measured by the circumference of the projection from the side. Uh, and a manufacturer will specify usually how they're marking that reference. Uh, and then the uh, parachute drag coefficient, that's basically a sort of an efficiency factor, it's unitless, uh, and that is a uh, empirical value means that the manufacturer has gone out and tested that. But uh, for most parachutes, we can assume that it's close to two. So that helps us make these assumptions or these, these, these decisions early on in a parachute uh, selection process. So we have a, an equation for D. We'll substitute that into our equation so we know that you know the weight of the rocket counteracts the drag of the parachute. So now we have a way to take the weight of the rocket and try to back out or reorder that equation to where we can look for that reference area. And there's the equation there. It's uh, two times the weight divided by the density of the air multiplied by the square of the velocity at which the rocket is descending uh, multiplied by the drag coefficient of the parachute. So there are variables on the right side of this equation that we have to substitute real values for in order to solve for that reference area. Depending on the manufacturer that you're going to go with, once you get, use these equations to make your ballpark assessment for what parachute size you're going to go out and look for, basically you're looking for a size to go and shop for. You'll review what the manufacturer states and you can go back and do these equations again to see if that particular parachute will match your requirements for that rocket. Um, th there's no real need to... Um, to try and convert one reference area to another because their drag coefficients are reported based on how they reference that area. So that drag coefficient value sort of acts as the, uh, as the not really the qualifier, but sort of the, uh, um, you know, brings the two back within sort of the same family, if that answers that question. <clears throat> Okay, so selecting variables for substitution here, we have the weight of the rocket, and we'll use, um, yeah, English units, we'll use pounds. Air density uh, at ground level, that's um, important to notice, uh, to note. Uh, you want these equations uh, to work out what your size of parachute you need to reach a safe descent velocity when the, ground, when the rocket hits the ground rather than when it's, you know, 5,000 feet in the air. Uh, we'll measure that in pounds mass per cubic foot. Uh, velocity at touchdown, we'll measure that in feet per second. And uh, drag coefficient, we'll make the assumption that it's 2. Uh, so typical values for a uh, touchdown velocity, uh, we'll use about 18 feet per second. And we're just making an assumption here to make this equation 
more palatable. Uh, and we'll make the assumption that the uh, air density at standard temperature and pressure for this altitude in Huntsville, Alabama is about 0 0.08 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, and then we'll uh, substitute those values into an equation <coughs> here. And you can see that it kind of reduces out to a very simple form of the equation where the only variable you have to plug in here is the weight of the rocket. Uh, so that is uh, 1.24 times the weight of the rocket, and the units that you'll get out of this equation are going to be feet squared. So that's going to give you the area of the parachute that you need to go shop for. It's important to note here that the, the weight that we're talking about is not your gross liftoff weight. It's your uh, rocket's uh, weight minus the propellant, so your burnout weight. All right, and uh, if you need to further convert that into a diameter, here's uh, the equation on how to to do that um, and substituting that into the same equation that, that you can calculate the diameter of a parachute needed as a 1.26 multiplied by the square root of the weight of the rocket and uh, that will give you that value in feet. So the two simplified equations here in the top left um, the, it makes these three assumptions you assume that this is a steady state uh, condition. You assume that the uh, touchdown velocity that you're targeting is 18 feet per second and that the uh, drag coefficient for the parachute is 2. Uh, now those are typical values. Uh, this is to get you into ballpark so you can start going to shop. The full equation here, which only makes the assumption that there's a steady state, apologize for the spelling error, I'll fix that. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit longer, but uh, you can work this into an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can uh, vary the, um, the touchdown velocity that you want uh, quite easily in there. So let's look at one example of that. Let's say calculate the parachute area and diameter needed for a 2.5 pound rocket to descend at 18 feet per second. So the only value that we have to plug in there is the uh, 2.5 pounds. Uh, so using a simplified equation, we see that we need a a parachute that's 3.1 feet squared. Uh, and then uh, to calculate the diameter, multiply that by the second equation to see that uh, we need a parachute that's 2 feet in diameter for this uh, 2.5 pound rocket. So one more example, uh, say if we were to calculate the parachute and area drag needed for a 10 pound rocket to descend at a 11.9 feet per second. Now, it seems kind of a random value, but it makes the math work out nice in the end. Um, so plugging these into the equation, see that you need a, um, a reference area of 28.3 feet per second, or sorry, uh, feet squared. And then to uh, calculate the diameter of that, you need a six foot diameter parachute. And, uh, so moving on to a discussion on the, uh, the ideal gas law, this is a, uh, an equation of state that uh, shows the relationship between uh, the pressure, temperature, and volume of an idealized gas, or basically an incompressible gas, uh, and that is uh, pressure times volume uh, is equal to the uh, amount of the gas generator is what I'm calling it, which is your black powder, uh, multiplied by your uh, a gas constant. and uh, an absolute temperature. In this case, what we're going to be using is we're going to be using the, uh, the the burn temperature or the combustion temperature of black powder. So those are the constants that are known. Uh, black powder burns at about 3300 Rankin. Oh, and uh, most rocket airframes are simple cylinders and bolt plates are simple circles. So it makes some of these assumptions, or some of these, uh, this math work out quite nicely. There's the equation for the volume of a cylinder, which is the volume of your airframe segment, which holds your uh, parachute. Uh, the equation for uh, pressure acting on a surface, that is uh, you know, force over an area. And then the equation for the area of a circle, which uh, is the area of a circular bulk plate. So reordering these equations, we can solve for the amount of gas generator that we need, which is typically 4F black powder. Uh, at 
gun uh, gun storage, you can buy multiple 1F, 2F, 3F, and even 4F powders. Um, that F is sort of a fineness. 4F black powder has the fastest burn rate, so it is the most efficient gas generator because your sections of the rocket, they're not airtight. They, they leak. Uh, and if they leak fast enough and you don't have a fast enough burn rate, uh, no matter what value of black powder you put in there, it's not going to be enough because it's going to leak out before you get enough pressure to, to eject your parachute. Okay, so substituting known values into here, uh, and you see that I've added a, um, a, a piece of the equation on the end. There's 454 grams per pound. Um, applying some of our uh, known values, we can simplify that equation to the, uh, the amount of black powder that we need in grams is equal to um, 0 0.0006 times the pressure required uh, times the volume of that section. And the, uh, the ejection charge measurements are typically reported in grams, therefore it is necessary to, to convert the pound's mass to grams. An example on that, so if you have a three inch airframe and um, you uh, have a, a main parachute that fits into a 23.6 inch long airframe, again it just makes the math work out nice in the end. Uh, and that is bulkhead to bulkhead. Uh, what size ejection charge is needed to generate 10 PSI inside the section? So we know our diameter, we can apply our, um, our volume equation. Uh, we know the diameter and the length. We see that the volume of this uh, particular section is 166.6 inches. I apologize for that. And then uh, we can calculate the charge size as 0 0.00. 0 0.06 times the pressure, which is 10 psi, times the volume, which is 166.6 inches. We see that you know we need one gram of black powder to um, to eject this um, you know this airframe or this this parachute. And another example, um, a three-inch airframe, you know, holding a, a main parachute in the same size volume. Uh, calculate the ejection charge needed to produce 141.3 pounds of force onto a nose cone bulk plate. So this is an equation and an example that is more uh, representative of what it is that you're going to look for in a high power rocket. Typically you'll apply shear pins to the system to keep the components together and you'll need to overcome the, the shear strength in those shear pins in order to eject the, um, the parachute. So you'll take the value of which uh, the those shear pins will shear at, and you want to produce a force on that bulkhead that is greater than that. Uh, and typically, you'd use a, a safety factor of 1.5. So if you uh, had a 100 pounds worth of shear and shear pins, you'd want to use 150 pounds of uh, force. So here we calculate the volume again. Uh, I really got to get better about cut and paste. Uh, we can uh, calculate the pressure, which is required. So that is that force over that area. We find we need a uh, you know, 20 psi there. And so we calculate the charge size by uh, substituting in our volume and our pressure requirement. We see that you know in order to um, eject this um, this parachute or to to create that much force on that bulkhead, we need to use two grams of black powder in this particular rocket. So in this talk, uh, I've shown you an example of you know how to apply Newton's second law of motion to parachutes, and this is the um, the equation that you want to use in its manipulated form to help you uh, size a parachute. And we've also uh, you know shown how to apply the ideal gas law to um, sizing ejection charges. Uh, and so you see the manipulated form of the equation there with the supporting equations that you need in order to do those uh, calculations. Right, and that is the end of uh, part one on this. And, um, we'll get to uh, part two um, maybe next month or in the month after. All right, uh, any questions?